smo lepo pozdravljeni na današnji znanstveni večer, kjer gostimo profesorja Karlo Semenco, ki je profesor neuropsihologije in kognitivne neuroznanosti na nekaj tatska v Trstu. Na nekaj tatska, točno tega. Na univerzi v Trstu. Profesor Karlo Semenca je sicer doktoriral, mislim, doktoriral, je naredil končal svojo medicino v Padovi in je v tem tudi diplomiral iz psihiatrije in takrat naprej ima različne pozicije v Padovi in v Trstu, na univerzijo v Padovi in v Trstu, vedno vezane na psihologijo in psihiatrijo. Kvarja se je večinoma z, pač danes smo ogledali, pa tudi poslušali eno od temeljih delke, s katerimi se je on ukvarjal, da so bile studija fazičnih bolnikov in kako so, kako afazija vpliva na dojemanje, pač oziroma na pozabljanje konkretno lastnih imen in navadnih občih imen. Kvarjo se tudi z drugimi stvarmi, naprimer s kognitivno, pardon, s kognicijo matematika ali matematično kognicijo in še z drugimi stvarmi, ki so pač vezane vedno na kognicijo, tudi malo na fazijo, pač na nevroznanosti. Verjetno bo to vse, kar bom povedal po slovenščini, zdaj naprej bo seveda vse v angliščini. So ja bo že giving a short introduction in Slovenijan, presenting you, what a great person you are. What a great scientist, sorry. Ja, so I was saying in Slovenijan earlier that, for those of you who do not speak Slovenijan, that Professor Karlo Semenca is a cognitive neuropsychiatrist or psychologist in Trieste, and he, I don't know, has done a lot of work, published a lot of journals, uh, published a lot of articles in several scientific journals, I guess. His list is up to 200 or so. He, he has been, he's a, in editorial boards of several important neuroscientists or cognitive science uh, journals, etc., etc. He is, yeah, he's a very prominent uh, scientist or cognitive scientist. So today he will speak about uh, aphasia and how aphasia affects proper and common name, uh, uh, let's say, remembering or something like that, or retrieval. Well, I guess I will leave it to him to explain. But well, thank uh, you for coming. Thank you for whatever you have said in Slovenian, and if it uh, was trustful to the English translation, thank you again. Uh, today, and uh, I have to thank you, uh, whoever invited me here for the University of Nova Gorica, for being in this marvelous building and the very nice valley I've never passed by before and it's really very, very pleasant. Uh, so I really enjoyed the trip here. And uh, uh, tonight I will uh, speak to you about something that interests everybody in the sense that uh, uh, what uh, is a common, very common experience is uh, to forget uh, name of people, or proper names. And uh, that is embarrassing, is socially, uh, again, embarrassing, and uh, you, wouldn't, you don't like that experience. But uh, where is grounded? Uh, it's grounded, I will show you, on the particular working uh, the brain does for retrieving proper names. That is basically very different from retrieving names of things. Uh, all this field brought me into studying how the brain uh, manages to represent and retrieve all categories of names. And uh, within uh, common names, uh, my interest, uh, which will be the second and shorter part of the talk, will concern the distinction between count nouns and must nouns. You know, count is uh, every object that can be counted, but the must, uh, we see this distinction before, is like water, sand, something that you cannot count. Uh, we'll go into this distinction uh, later. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, The Neuropsychology of Name Kinds. And I will show that the brain does very different things depending on which sort of name has to retrieve, to remember. Starting with proper and common names, uh, why do they differ at all? And uh, were psychologists interested in proper names uh, at all? They were not till about uh, 20 years ago. While a philosopher, and uh, if there is a philosopher among you, uh, will instead remember that uh, in philosophy they were dealing with this problem 
uh, for a long time, at least uh, to my knowledge, starting with Stuart Mill and then maybe uh, in modern times with Saul Kripke, one of the fanciest philosophers uh, uh, around these days. And in linguistics, uh, there were some other people that uh, more recently uh, worked a bit on this uh, distinction. Uh, I will give you uh, the basic idea of why proper names are different uh, from common names. Uh, and uh, the biggest difference is that uh, uh, proper names are, uh, uh, do not bring information. Do, while uh, common names bring you categorical information, common names do not bring any information per se. They simply design a person, a particular person, and if you do not know that person, with the common name you do nothing. So when I speak about a horse, you know that at least uh, it's a big animal uh, that uh, uh, runs fast, uh, has, and that applies to any thing that is called horse. But if I say George Bush, if you do not know this guy, you do not, and uh, if you are lucky, you do not know this guy, uh, then you, uh, you don't know uh, what this, you may say, well, it might be Anglo-Saxon, it might be a male, but that's it, I don't know anything. Uh, so in technical terms, the, the important thing is that uh, proper names design individuals and not categories, unlike uh, common names. Uh, so, uh, just to give you the feeling of what it is to remember a proper name or to work out what a proper name is and uh, what another a common name is, I give you a quiz. Uh, uh, Lanco, you shut up because you saw already. But uh, nobody solved this quiz. But I can assure you that unless you are really very absent-minded, you know the name that is that corresponds to the first definition, and you know also the name that corresponds to the second definition. I assume that you all know what uh, the definition, what corresponds to the third definition is kangaroo. But uh, what is the second? I tell you, you know it. You are here, you know it. Okay? So I w won't waste time because I've, sent, I've shown this quiz to 1,000 people so far, and nobody solved it. But this is the answer. <laughs> uh, this was my grandfather, who was an engineer, he built dams, he, he was bald, and, uh, and so on. But uh, you know the phonological, since you came here, you know the phonological form, but there is no way to link, it's entirely arbitrary, to link one name to that set of attributes. Because I have entirely different attributes, I'm not bold, and I have exactly the same name. Uh, there are several questions I will try to answer in this uh, uh, talk very briefly because I won't go into technical uh, detail uh, too much. But uh, one thing is, uh, what can neuropsychological findings? I'm a neuropsychologist. I, uh, what I do is to look at people with brain lesions and try to understand from their behavior how the normal behavior is. The logic being that uh, the system is organized in a sort of modular way. So the observation of a person that has lost a, a bit of their behavior after a brain injury, tells me how what is left works. And that, that gives me a hint of what is the whole system working. How is the whole system working? So uh, really, brain damage makes transparent what normal behavior, uh, what is opaque to the observation of normal behavior because we do a lot of things very easily. We perform lots of cognitive tasks, like speaking, very easily, absent-mindedly, without any effort. Somebody who has 
part of his brain taken out by brain damage, he uh, has to use uh, several ways of, to overcome the lack of this little bit of the brain. And that can give us the idea on how the brain works to perform those tasks that we all here could perform and can perform so easily. Uh, so I will tell one thing. One of the problem is, uh, are proper names and common names processed separately? Are remembered in a different way? Or can be proper names and common names located differently in the brain? And uh, is proper name processing more difficult? Everybody says so, but one thing is to say so. One thing is to demonstrate that that is the case. Uh, you know, lots of people thought that the art was flat. You know, it took some time to demonstrate that it was not flat. And uh, that was the intuition, but uh, somebody had a different intuition. So the intuition of everybody is that proper names are more difficult than common names, but you have to demonstrate it properly. So uh, one thing that I will very briefly tell, because I was invited by linguists, is do, does what I see in the brain uh, tell uh, uh, with brain damage uh, reveal something about the formal linguistic theories? I mean, not uh, just the uh, intuitive uh, linguistic theory, but uh, something that uh, people have worked a lot uh, to work out and to, uh, uh, to build uh, theories of how the language structure it is. And uh, I want to know whether there is uh, some psychological reality and some neurological reality behind that theoretical construct. That is standing itself, but it, what is important is to see, and it's a question apart, uh, to see whether that theory has also some psychological and uh, neurological underpinning. Then can your psychology of proper names be used for clinical purposes? So if anybody here is a clinician who is, for instance, interested in Alzheimer's disease or something like that, may be interested in, in this last question. And everybody, what everybody wants to know is, am I getting Alzheimer? You know, I'm already on the road, but most of the people here is younger than me, so they do not have that worry. But when you leave, when you arrive at a certain age, you start worrying about these things. So one of the uh, methods we seek in neuropsychology is uh, to try to observe one important finding. The pivotal finding we are uh, looking for is dissociation. Somebody who does well one thing, one cognitive task, and very badly one other task. What I mean very badly is just below, below the performance of any possible normal person, I mean person without the brain damage. Okay, and I'll show you in a minute what I'm uh, uh, speaking of. So what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, I was looking for, and I've been looking for for 20 years now, and I discovered the first, uh, examples is people that uh, could uh, uh, easily retrieve names of any object, but forgot entirely, and I mean entirely, 100% proper names. Okay? And uh, what uh, is important then, once you have observed this phenomenon, what you want to know whether is, there is also the opposite phenomenon, because otherwise you can always argue that proper names are more difficult, and therefore it needs just a little bit of brain damage to switch off all proper names and leave all common names. But if instead you get also the opposite phenomenon, then you have the grounds for claiming that proper names and common names have a different uh, support in different parts of the brain. So that was uh, what I was hunting for the last 20 years. 
Uh, indeed, there exists, I discovered about 20 years ago, the first patient with the anomia for proper names. What do they do? I'll give you a very quick description of this um, patient. They uh, cannot uh, remember uh, proper names of real people, uh, so they don't know the names even of their closest family members and uh, of their hometown. They do not know if uh, given picture of famous people. There are 20 people that in every culture are so famous that everybody remembers them. Okay? So in Italy, I'm not mentioning you what they are, but uh, you probably, it probably overlaps with you quite a lot, with the people you know quite a lot. Uh, and then, uh, and they are also very bad on, on, on definition. So th they uh, cannot uh, uh, name people when shown them, but also when giving a definition, who is the former president of, uh, or the current prime minister, something like that. I forgot the prime minister of Italy before this, I don't know why, uh, this time. Then, uh, also in category naming, if I tell you, well, tell me any name, fine. But if I tell you, tell me any name of musician, of singers, of sportsmen or politicians, well, people, these people won't be able to tell you any name. Of course, you have to tap a little bit of these categories because, of course, if you get to my mother and ask her, tell me the name of soccer players, football players, she won't know. But she would know, you know, opera singers or something like that. And uh, so you have to balance this against uh, peer no, uh, people knowledge, but uh, it is pretty clear that uh, these uh, patients, while perform pretty well with proper uh, with common names, are very bad with the uh, name of people. There are two varieties, uh, and uh, one is all proper names, and another is proper name, person names only. The first one described in literature was from me and Marina Zettin, and this published, uh, the second is published on Nature 89, uh, and it, that made the field rather popular uh, since when you find we managed to publish in some fancy place, people start believing that what you are seeing is true and important. Uh, in any case, uh, what happens with these people that do not remember uh, uh, proper names? Really, in this 100% to, to zero fashion, uh, what they do is uh, that they understand proper names pretty well. They, uh, so they, they know that uh, this guy is the president of the republic and so on, and they know his degree, know about his wife, know everything, but not the name. One other thing is that uh, if you try to uh, give uh, a little cue, a little suggestion, that doesn't work. Another thing is, and this is uh, very dramatic, is uh, the immediate recall. So I said, that, look, my name is Carlo Semenza. Please repeat it. Okay, Carlo Semenza, fine. Tell me again, Carlo Semenza. Look, I really want to be sure that you learn my name. My name is Carlo Semenza. Again, Carlos Semenza. Okay, now count back from 100 to zero. 100, 99, 98, 97, what's my name? Forgot, okay? So if you prevent them for keeping saying, you know, Carlos Semenza, Carlos Semenza, Carlos Semenza, then it goes. Uh, and uh, what we found in that nature's paper is that uh, it sort of confirmed the, the idea that philosopher had about the uh, uh, arbitrary link between the name and the reference, uh, the, the, the thing. Because uh, we gave other 
things to learn. We tested other things with the spatial that are arbitrary, like phone numbers. Okay? And he forgot phone numbers. Uh, for numbers he knew before. And uh, also names of pieces of music, of worthless pieces of music. So he, he heard uh, about um, some, some piece of music. I'm not singing for you, but uh, he was able to uh, uh, go along and clearly demonstrated that he knew these popular pieces of classical music. And then what is this? Wouldn't tell the name because the name there's no way, uh, reason why Moonlight Serenade from Beethoven should be called the Moonlight Serenade. I mean, could be, you know, I mean, uh, Moon Over the Moon or something like that, uh, with the, exactly the same uh, uh, level of arbitrariness. But that was, uh, uh, he, he forgot uh, this name. So we had an idea that. Uh, the brain has a special difficulties in putting together something in, a, in an arbitrary way, giving a name in an arbitrary way. What we then found was, uh, while the, these first people understood everything, we uh, found other cases, very strange cases, that showed us that the information for individual people is preserved in the brain in a very different way from the information about things. So what we found is a patient that not only wasn't able to tell proper name, but forgot all the information about the, the people, all the information about places, okay? So even in understanding, now they forget that they don't know what you know, uh, George Bush's uh, or other people, they simply do not know. But uh, before we could get to this case that told us clearly that while they know very difficult names actually and, uh, and very difficult concepts, so they, people knew what a laser was, they knew what, uh, you know, exegesis is about, but forgot the names of people and the information about people. So, uh, but before my friend Michelli in the University of Roma found a such case, and then uh, uh, we had a very funny case, and I'm telling you because it's a bit picturesque. I call it uh, the Pavarotti case. <laughs> so what uh, we did, look at the, a, a person like that uh, would didn't, uh, uh, we didn't know the names like the others. But then, as uh, soon as we uh, started testing him, it was clear that the, the patient was different. Because he could not tell also the information. He said, just, you know, this person I know about. But I forgot who he is, not only his name, also who he is. But uh, at a certain point we said, uh, Look, but uh, don't you recognize Pavarotti? Oh, yes, Luciano Pavarotti. Uh, of course, the most famous tenor uh, uh, ever, uh, I mean, uh, contemporary tenor. He uh, is fat, he has a, a, a black beard, uh, he uh, sings always with a white scarf in his hand. And recently, it was uh, some years ago, left his wife for a younger woman, which was nothing new. I mean, there is, that uh, goes on all the time that people leave the wives for a younger woman. What was important in this case is that the, this accident uh, happened after the patient got his lesion. So he learned this fact, and he was able to understand this fact, uh, to remember this fact only if given the key constituted by proper by the name. So if we told him, look, uh, who is the most famous uh, singer in the world, uh, opera singer in the world, he wouldn't say. And uh, uh, he wouldn't say, I mean, I don't remember the name, but he's fat and he's, uh, he uses the white scarves and so on. So it looked like that information about people is 
was a sort of encapsulated in some place in his brain, but not accessible, except with the key constituted by the name. <coughs> Another strange case is prosopanomia uh, that we discovered recently. And these uh, 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 people that cannot name faces, but can name anything else. So if we say, who is the president of the republic, they could tell. We show a face, and they say, you know, this is the, the prime minister, but I don't know the name. Very strange. Because why do they, uh, are they unable to, uh, why do they not to cue themselves? They should say, look, I see that this guy is the prime minister, then give it, uh, myself a definition. This is the prime minister, the prime minister is Mr. X, okay? They don't do that. It's a very strange phenomenon, but it has been shown in neuropsychology for 100 years for objects, not for faces. And uh, what we demonstrated is that it, it works for faces. Okay, so you cannot derive directly a name from the face. Like in some cases in neuropsychology, you cannot say this is a chair. You can tell everything, you recognize this chair, so it's not what is, we call an agnosia for chair. We see perfectly, but the name, putting the name is very difficult. And the, but if we touch it or we sit on it, on it is fine, we can say, I don't know, this is a chair. Hmm? So it's putting a name to a visual configuration. But we wanted to know it was just uh, to uh, put a person name to a visual configuration or a, a name to a face. And uh, so I'll show you. Uh, we did the, since this guy was a Murano glass blower, we showed him, the, we gave him this test. Uh, there is no Venetian worth of being a Venetian would miss a Seguso from a Venini, let alone a, gla a Murano glass master. And he said, in fact, that that was a Seguso, that was a Venini, but if shown the picture of his wife, he wouldn't tell the name, okay? Which is very odd. So th there are at least uh, four variances uh, for different uh, reasons that I briefly told you about uh, uh, not being able of uh, uh, retrieving a proper name. One, it is because you have uh, something missing in accessing the phonological form. One, it is because the information is wiped out from your brain entirely, and uh, a along with information about the, the semantic information, and, then, uh, and that comes into different variances and uh, uh, varieties, and the other is naming the inability to name faces. But what about the opposite phenomenon? Forgetting common names for, uh, and remembering proper names. Well, th there is also this phenomenon, although a little bit more uh, difficult to, to find. And in fact, uh, the only, the, the more convincing play uh, case is still to be published uh, and uh, has been described by the, some uh, Portuguese uh, uh, recently and uh, is currently under review on a journal, but it will be published eventually. And it's very interesting and so, what we get is this double dissociation that guarantees us, we call it double dissociation, the bottom line, it is guarantees us that uh, these two entities are really independent in the brain. Uh, the recognition of proper names I'm not uh, annoying uh, you with, but uh, the bottom line again is that uh, recognizing famous names is done uh, uh, 
by a wider part of the brain than recognizing names of objects. So there is a contribution of the right hemisphere. And my colleague, uh, Diana van Lanker in New York, claims that uh, that is because the right hemisphere uh, supports uh, emotional uh, memory. And so, uh, you know, since pro famous proper names uh, give you often some emotional uh, uh, link, then you, you get uh, in recognizing uh, some advantage for famous uh, uh, people. And uh, so, uh, this is a technical way of putting it, but uh, uh, as I told you, uh, really we have a sort of demonstration that uh, proper names and common names are dealt with independently in the brain. Why is that? Uh, they, this state of affairs, and we will see about location in the brain soon, uh, why happened? Why di did the evolution uh, allow this different destiny of proper names and common names? And I think that there is a really serious reason, reason, reason and it is that it is very important to be smart in defining categories, okay? And also, on the, so to say lions are dangerous, okay? And uh, to say swamps are dangerous. And, uh, but also, uh, and also to say this person is dangerous, or this particular individual is dangerous, or this particular animal is dangerous, or this place is dangerous. You don't want to go to this place. And then you have to have a name of it and single it out. And that is very important. And also, I think there is a bit of uh, social and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sexual uh, underpinning because, you know, the scenario I have uh, in mind is some several thousand years ago, uh, there was in a cave, uh, in a community, there was a very young, furry woman, very nice, uh, very furry, but the, the most beautiful for the standards of that time. And she was pursued by everybody. But at that time, women were called Granf. But one smart guy thought, I call you Grimf. And she said, oh. You surely single me out, out of everybody. You know I'm special. And she, you know, the, the progeny was made by this desirable woman. And she gave birth to more people than uh, uh, the competitors. So, uh, so in this way, people who were smarter in singling out individuals from categories, they were the ones who to cover the planet. So uh, this is the model. Uh, we like to do theoretical models about how it works in, in uh, abstractly, but then we will put on some brain plays here. Uh, and uh, the important thing of this model is that uh, you have to distinguish uh, personal semantics, uh, the information about people, from uh, semantics of objects, of things, general semantics. And they both activate the lexicon in a different way. One activates the proper name lexicon, and the other activates the uh, common name lexicon. And uh, the entrance is there. And uh, the cases I've shown to you, but uh, I'm not going to annoy you because we have no time to work out exactly the defect. But the one, two, three, and four are exactly the description of this theoretical model uh, of the damage to the sort of different patients I've described for you uh, uh, before. And uh, I, I show you this model because uh, to give you an idea 
to give the non-professionals, uh, non-neuropsychologists an idea of how we work. We basically build models and try to uh, separate out different, how the brain performs different tasks. Uh, what about localization? There are several ways, uh, sources of uh, understand, for understanding where in the brain all this happens. And the one is laterality studies. There are techniques for showing things just to an hemisphere, to present uh, things just to the right or the left part of your brains. And then there are ways of measuring the uh, electricity produced by the brain and uh, uh, showing that uh, it differs according to the task the brain is performed. And then there is PET uh, and other neuroimaging uh, are these new machines that uh, take pictures of your brain working and th that uh, uh, they become very popular. Unfortunately, since uh, myself I'm not a rich guy, so, do, uh, so I do not have this machinery, I think that they are simply photographers. They do not think people that use these things, but uh, their opinion is different from mine. But uh, I think there is a bit of, a wo of truth uh, when I say they do not think, because you cannot uh, simply take pictures as in photography. You cannot take pictures and then claim that is the truth. You have to interpret the picture. Bef and what it means, you have to have a theory about what is in the picture. Okay? I think uh, this is gra can be grasped uh, even by the layman. Uh, and, and the, the of course, uh, the last... Uh, 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 method is my favorite method, and is the one I used so far uh, uh, for as an example of, for this talk. So I will uh, go quite uh, quickly to the conclusions uh, uh, that. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm telling you that uh, what is the current idea is that there is probably a dedicated module, a part of the brain that takes care of, co of proper names instead of uh, 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 common names. But uh, it's, it, it is very difficult to localize it. Uh, partly is uh, the anterior part of the temporal pole, uh, lobe, which is a part of the brain on the left temporal lobe. But that is probably, I think, involved in naming faces, but not in other uh, uh, retrieval of proper names in other conditions, like on definition and so on. And uh, uh, there is a, uh, certainly a network of several places in the, in the left hemisphere. There's nothing really on, the, on this side of the brain. Everything of this sort happens here. But then, uh, which exactly, uh, we know a bit what are the components of this network. But also, we think that is more subject to variation among individuals. And so we are not now in the position to specify exactly where in the brain uh, uh, common names the proper names are processed, and uh, uh, we do not know. And uh, uh, it will take some time so to understand how this network uh, works. But a different, entirely different uh, question is, now, we know it's common names and uh, 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 proper names go separate routes in the brain. But what we want to know is if one route is like a highway, it's very easy, or, and the other is a mountain trail, very hard, or they are more or less equal. Everybody says, as I told you, that everybody claims that the proper names is the mountain trail. But is that true? Well, not, uh, not easy to show. But uh, uh, because the research done before my own uh, has been done in a way, in a very strange way. 
suppose I come to next conference. And uh, in the meanwhile, at the end of this, I give you a little book where you write every name you forget from now to the next conference. And then I come to the next conference and collect the books. And what I'm sure I would find is that most of what you have written as forgotten names in your experience is proper names, names of people. Why is that? Simply because you are terribly embarrassed of seeing some guy that you are supposed to know, and he says, yes, hello, how do you do? And you do not know. And you know that that happens all the time, okay? And especially when you are starting getting old. So that doesn't count. That method is biased. It doesn't work. So, and also it doesn't work uh, simply giving faces to name and objects to name, because faces are more close to each other perceptually, more difficult to distinguish. So it's a difficult uh, uh, method and uh, doesn't, and is also a biased method. So what we did instead was to uh, simply take names and uh, proper names and common names and get, uh, give people long lists to remember, or names that uh, everybody knows. But uh, simply names uh, like, uh, you know, Carlo, Boris, Lanco, and so on. And then uh, names of things, rows, uh, table, uh, but we matched carefully for frequency and every other possible uh, com phonological complexity, and so on. And we gave to remember uh, in a way that uh, somebody uh, had uh, that even normal subject uh, forgot a bit of the name of the list. When you do that in psychology, what you find is uh, typically that you, uh, uh, if I give you a dozen names, you remember about seven immediately. And what uh, uh, you forget is uh, especially the, the ones that are in the middle. So you remember the first I tell you, and the last I tell you. And the first are called the priority effect, and the, sec and the last is the recency effect. In the middle, you forget. Now, what is uh, the common knowledge about psychologists is that the recency effect depends on immediate memory, and the priority effect depends on how you get out of your long-term memory a name. And that is the way to measure whether proper names and common names are really uh, uh, different. I'll show you one patient. How did it? You see, he has no priority effect. This is a patient that if given the name, he remembers everything, but, uh, but uh, cannot uh, uh, remember, uh, retrieve uh, the name. What he does, if I, if I give him a, a, a list of a, a dozen uh, words, in this case 10 words, if it is 10 names, he forgets entirely, has no priority effect, okay? And, uh, but is as good with the, uh, with the names of, uh, of people, uh, of uh, objects, and uh, while instead the control subjects, so people that are not that have not uh, this anomia condition this guy has, uh, they perform slightly less well. So if I come to you, what was my demonstration of the difficulty of uh, the proper names with respect to common names? Is that uh, if I come to you. Uh, and on average, uh, making the test with you, uh, uh, you, re you would remember a couple of names less in the, the priority range, a couple of proper names, while you would uh, do considerably better with common names, while the recency effect would be the same. This little difference everybody here has on the priority effect, on the names you, I'm telling you first, in favor of common names, widens a lot with age. When you become 65, instead of two names less, 
is three four main dementia. And if you get Alzheimer, you get flat. You have no priority effect at all. Okay? And that is one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer. So don't do the test to yourself. But <laughs> so we sort of demonstrated that uh, the highway versus footpath path, uh, uh, theory was true. Uh, proper names are indeed more difficult to remember. Well, th does neuropsychology reveal something about linguistic theories about proper names? This is too difficult. Uh, 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 and it's only for linguists. How many linguists are here? One? Well, <laughs> two. Okay? Uh, uh, we simply showed that uh, uh, you know, proper names in, uh, in, uh, 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 in most languages in most conditions, do not uh, take the determinant. I do not uh, say the Lanco, uh, for instance, or, or the Carlo. We, we don't say that. Okay? But uh, for instance, in Italian, if you uh, wanted to, uh, if you say surnames of people, if you wanted to know, uh, to show that uh, that uh, surname corresponds to a woman, you know, Pavarotti, we say Pavarotti. But if you say Callas, we have to say la callas, okay? We, we say that in Italian. And, uh, uh, well, we tested this knowledge in patients. And uh, while uh, patients that are bad with grammar uh, simply put the article also before Pavarotti, so using it, it as a common name, Alzheimer's, who have no sources enough uh, intellectual sources to uh, uh, properly uh, uh, retrieve the rule, the grammatical rule, did a chance, uh, did uh, always say la callas, but they didn't know whether to say il Pavarotti or, uh, or say Pavarotti. That is a very simple uh, uh, demonstration that uh, uh, the theory that they do not have reason why we did this is that uh, there is a claim that uh, uh, proper names uh, that that happens the uh, proper names do not uh, take uh, the article because they themselves are the article in a sense okay and uh, that is very difficult to explain it to you why but uh, this is the theory linguists uh, have or some linguists have, uh, like uh, uh, Giuseppe Longobardi, uh, who works in Trieste with me. And uh, it happens uh, to correspond uh, to something that uh, is really in the brain. But uh, I understand that this part, uh, I thought that there were more linguists around, and uh, it was just uh, for them. In any case, uh, the idea is that the linguistic theory about proper name can be independently supported by uh, uh, neuropsychology findings, meaning that uh, sometimes when linguists uh, do formal description of language, sometimes also describe something that actually happens in the brain. What about clinical purposes? Uh, well, I I'm telling you that uh, uh, a simple test with the proper names, uh, retrieval, predicted uh, 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 the develop of Alzheimer on patients who could not uh, be diagnosed as Alzheimer's in the first place when they were first uh, uh, seen. We did a retrospective study a few months, uh, uh, a year later when they developed Alzheimer and saw that the, those who developed Alzheimer, the only test that they differed from the others at uh, the time we met them, was proper naming pro with proper names. So, uh, naming with pro proper name anomia, we call it, is uh, something that uh, uh, really is, uh, goes uh, appears very early in Alzheimer's disease. But uh, 
and that is the bottom line for the next study. Don't worry if you do not remember proper names because that happens all the time. The, when you have to worry is the case when the name goes on, goes away forever and ever. You, it's your experience typically that uh, you do not remember the proper name when you want to use it, then you go away and then you, ah, that was the name. If that happens, it's entirely physiological. The problem starts when you forget uh, some names and then you forget a little bit about the person as well and re never remember the name. Then uh, you, start to, you start to worry or somebody else worries for you because maybe you do not realize that you are going into trouble. Well, very briefly, five minutes uh, to tell about uh, mass and count nouns because I realize we might be running out of time. Uh, there are these di this big difference is better explained by the following example. Count nouns applies to perceptual entities that in combination do not yield another entity of the same time. So one dog plus another dog doesn't make a bigger dog, okay? One dog, if you divide your dog in two, you don't get two dogs, okay? Believe me, that doesn't happen. But with water, water plus water gives you a larger quantity of water. And if you divide the quantity of water in two, what is left is two quantities that are still water. So that is the big difference between the two categories. And, uh, and they are, uh, that also applies uh, to abstract ideas, believe it or not, but uh, if you think it applies, because for instance, you can have only one courage, you know, you can have courage, but you may have several ideas. So idea is count, courage is mass, just one. So, uh, they are uh, syntactic. Uh, every language uh, have, uh, has different syntactic uh, syntax, a particular syntax that uh, uh, applies to one or the or two of the uh, one or the other category. And uh, I'm not annoying you with that. But what we found is that uh, there was a person who violated all mass count rules must now rules. So uh, he uh, said, said uh, I want a water, which we cannot say in, uh, in Italian or in English. I don't know in Slovenian, but uh, I think there are proper rules for Slovenian. And uh, so they, this patient has left, uh, has missed all the particular rules that go with must nouns. And that means uh, uh, to us that our brain treats some aspect of the syntax independently from other aspect of the syntax because this person spoke perfectly well uh, and syntactically in a correct way in other domains. Uh, other things are interesting. Uh, Gabriela Vigliocco, a uh, now psycholinguist, but uh, who worked with me uh, as a student, she found out that uh, people that could not name one thing use the proper article, a mass article, or a, a, an article for count, uh, if, uh, if asked which was the article that was proper. So even if they forgot the name of chair, they could say this is a, I don't know, but with water, they said this is water or this is the water or whatever is correct in the language that uh, and uh, well we found a patient uh, uh, who looked at the words in naming with count uh, uh, in uh, uh, with respect to mass nouns and uh, uh, Borgo and Shalis, a student of mine and uh, uh, Professor Shalis from uh, CISA in uh, Trieste, 
uh, found out instead that uh, uh, patients with uh, that had the big difficulties in remembering living things, that is a one phenomenon that we, we uh, show after brain damage, also had problems with the mass. So it's uh, strange because mass is not living in general. Substances are not living. And then uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we have uh, uh, rather good evidence uh, just looking at how the electricity varies in the brain while you try to remember and uh, use these names, that they are different. And uh, at this point, I think I've spoken enough and you're tired. And uh, thank you very much. So I, I don't know, I guess maybe we should start with questions unless, and then, yeah, so if there are questions, please. Please. Uh, sometimes some problem names are identical to common names. Uh -huh. Or in Japanese or uh, Chinese, all the problem names are, have also some meaning. Yes. What happens? What happens then? Okay. It, it depends on the context. Again, so uh, that is exactly what we tried. We saw, you know, a pigeon that in Italian is Colombo, and asked, uh, what's this? And they could say Colombo. And then we showed Christopher Colombo. They didn't know. <laughs> so a follow-up on this question. I mean, there yeah. are place names that not only are common names, but actually mean something that is somehow significant in that place. I don't know, surely there is a place called Ponte Vecchio in Italy. Yeah. Or Canal Grande in, in Venezia. I mean, that would be a problem. Uh, name, but it's yeah. Clearly descriptive. Right. So. Right. I, if uh, you saw any old bridge, okay, they can say this is a Vecchio Ponte and Ponte Vecchio, okay? But then if you show that bridge, what is this? They wouldn't say it's Ponte Vecchio. They would say it's a bridge, but I don't remember the name of the bridge. It's old, but yeah. <laughs> it's old. <laughs> you know, so it's exactly the same uh, thing. And we carefully use this contrast because, of course, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was one of the demonstrations that really depends on the context, depends on the kind of cognitive operation you do. If you describe the category of Ponte Vecchio, or of pigeons, okay, that, uh, uh, that is easy. And that applies to any old bridge, on, to any pigeon. You see pigeons in Ljubljana Square, uh, pigeons in San Marco Square, Colombo, Colombo. But uh, then, if you get to the guy who discovered America, his you know, canonic uh, uh, picture that is shown everywhere, who is this guy? Well, he discovered America, but I forgot what the name is. So I guess... Mm. Ah. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask... Uh, you have shown us one figure, and there yeah. you have two control groups, yeah. for control groups for uh, common names and proper names. Yes. How do you select persons for uh, control groups? Mm. Persons for the, the control groups. Well, just people that were about the age and culture of the, of the person we, uh, uh, we were testing uh, against. I mean, the, we had to show the patient. And then, so in that case, was people that was about 50, like uh, what the patient was, about uh, 10 years of schooling how the patient was, and so on. So, and they're coming from about the same place. Okay, but that, uh, in fact, uh, was something that uh, really wasn't, we did as a precaution, but uh, when we did the experiment on normal, so normal people, uh, uh, just to show that, uh, you know, the, the, the first names in the place, in the, in the list, were forgotten, 
easier, easier, more easily if they were proper names than uh, common names, then we didn't have the same. Uh, and one thing I forgot to tell you, because uh, the, there was no time, uh, and it's interesting, is that we say, well, why are uh, proper names more difficult? Do they ask more from the brain in terms of sources? So what we did is to do the same experiment on people who went to Mount Everest. You know that the Italian Research Council has a little lab on Mount Everest at 5,000 meters high. And uh, uh, we tested the alpinists that stayed there two weeks. And we tested them before they went up, when they arrived up, and then after two weeks, and then when they came back 45 year, days later. Okay, after two weeks of lack of oxygen, they were, their priority effect for proper names went down dramatically, while more or less the priority effect for common names stayed the same. So lack of oxygen takes out the little extra energy for you to recall, to retrieve a proper name. And that uh, is very interesting. And the, it took uh, 45 days for them to recover, and not quite, after they came back to the... So, I mean, that goes, you know, maybe somebody is an alpinist here and goes that high, not in Slovenia, but somewhere else, and stays that high. It's a bit dangerous to stay that high because some part of your cognitive system uh, go uh, get ruined a little bit, and uh, and maybe then you recover when you come back. But it's not a, 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 it's a bit of a dangerous thing to do. And in fact, alpinists, uh, you know, when they report some lack of judgment uh, when they go up, uh, you know, the, there are other functions that uh, go down uh, when when you uh, under lack of oxygen. And uh, it's a bit uh, scary. Well, no, well, thank you. Okay. Thank you.